All right, good to go? Sounds good live? <laughs> check, check, good, all right. Well, welcome back. Um, we are entering a second session uh, that is part of an eschat eschatol eschatological primer. It's hard for me to say, too. And uh, the reason we're doing that is to make sure that you are at least aware, in a cursory sense, of other views that exist in the church besides the view that we espouse here in our ministry. Necessary to do for a number of reasons. Necessary for your own personal understanding. Necessary uh, to be able to understand where other believers are coming from. And necessary to understand the implications and ramifications that holding one of these other views can have when uh, the rubber meets the road and eschatology uh, affects doctrine uh, beyond its own sphere. So as we said in the last session, eschatology is the study of the Bible's teaching about last things. Uh, eschatos means final or last. Logos means logic. So it's really the logic of last things. And our uh, recommend. Uh, let's, let's review a key couple key terms. I don't want to engage in too much review because uh, I know we just did this, but the church age is the time period from the beginning of the church, i.e. 32 AD until Jesus returns. Uh, the earthly life and ministry of Christ comprise his first coming. Maybe we could put that up on the screen for everybody in the house, Michelle. And uh, the rapture, which we'll be dealing with in two subsequent sessions, two standalone, but subsequent sessions to this one, uh, is the imminent catching up of the saints to be with Christ before the advent of the great tribulation. Then we have the second coming, a separate and distinct return of Christ, bodily return of Christ to reign on the earth as king. The period known as the great tribulation is an often misunderstood but highly talked about period of time in scripture. We'll deal with that when we deal with the uh, rapture teaching. Uh, it is a time when disasters happen on the earth and people who are faithful to Christ suffer great persecution. We do not deny that there will be people who are faithful to Christ that suffer great persecution during that time. However, it will not be the church as it exists now. <clears throat> the millennium is what we're going to cover in this session. Uh, the, the four views concerning this millennium. The thousand-year reign of the Messiah on earth as described in Revelation 20, 1 through 6, which we will jump into those scriptures and reread them uh, just to be very familiar with them in our practice. In the last session, we covered four views on how the book of Revelation should be interpreted. I will just paint this general chart out for you quickly and briefly review them just so they're in your mind as I know you're all caffeine-charged and sugar-crazed from donuts and whatnot after the break. So the first view we looked at is the idealist view. It, it pretty much spiritualizes or allegorizes everything. It looks for lessons and principles. Uh, it's not, it says Revelation is not chronological, but allegorical of recurring realities, spiritual realities. Then we have the historicist view, which means that uh, Revelation is pre-written, church history from John onward. It requires large amounts of conjecture and needs to be revised because they operate on a one day as a thousand years and Revelation talks about 1260 days. So technically the second coming should have happened around 1260 AD. Uh, and a big fault with this view is uh, that uh, it is so locked in, so dead set into thinking that the Antichrist refers to the papacy that it can't see any other possible um, interpretations, so much so that they think any other interpretations are satanically inspired to prevent people from understanding who the Antichrist is. Now, it doesn't mean that the Antichrist couldn't be a pope. We are not saying that. It is certainly possible. There have been a lot of bad popes, but if you remember back in the days when this view was popular, that's when some really horrible popes were... Um, on the papal throne doing completely despicable things. We did an entire session reviewing a history of the papacy, if you want to familiarize yourself with that. 
Uh, but obviously, none of those popes were the Antichrist. So how bad is the Antichrist really going to be? Well, honestly, he's going to be terrific, and everybody's going to love him. They're not going to universally despise him, right? He is the greatest mask the world has ever seen. <clears throat> then we have the preterist view. I gave you the caveat last time that full preterism or hyper preterism is the belief that all prophecy and revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD up to and including the second coming, and that is universally decried as heresy. So when I say preterism, I do not mean a full preterism. I am not accusing anybody of being a full preterist. I mean they are partial preterists. They believe that most prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, but the second coming is yet future. All preterism or preterist means is in the past, okay? That's where the word comes from. Then you have the futurist view, focuses on a literal, or as we put it, a precise interpretation of the text. We talked about Daniel 9, the Olivet Discourse, the differences between Matthew 24 and Luke 21, etc., all of which we have done standalone sessions on. And if you are watching this video and you're not familiar with what I am talking about, stop what you are doing, go to those sessions, watch those sessions, be enthralled with the sound of my voice, and learn something. Now we're moving on. We need to require a literal interpretation of linked Old Testament prophecies. That is what makes the futurist view important. Revelation contains eight hundred allusions, over 800 allusions to Old Testament prophecies, and describes their literal fulfillment. It is not just about whether or not Revelation requires a literal fulfillment, but those vast amount of prophecies in the Old Testament that have, as of yet, gone unfulfilled, need to be fulfilled literally as well. Jesus fulfilled all 108 unique prophecies in the Old Testament to the letter, why would he not fulfill all eight times that for his second coming to the letter? That's why we stand on the, the historist view. But as we said in the last session, our view is highly criticized by its opponents. But some of those criticisms really don't pass muster. We talked about that a little bit. We will continue to talk about that ongoing in different places. But for the duration, of this session this morning, we are going to segue to this topic about four views of the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. And what this has to do with is your theory of interpretation. In Bible seminaries, that, that phrase, theory of interpretation, is turned into a big fancy word. That big fancy word is hermeneutics comes from a Greek term, hermeneuo, which means to translate or to interpret. So therefore, your hermeneutic is the method you use, symbolic, allegorical, uh, historical, spiritualizing, or precise and literal, your method of interpreting the scripture. So when we say we have a literal or a, uh, a precise method of interpreting the scripture, we are in fact describing our hermeneutic. So, let's go back in and reread these six verses from Revelation 20, verse 1. I read them at the end of the last session, just so you can familiarize yourself with them. I want you to have them in your mind as we go through this session, because they are essential for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> the question about whether or not what I am about to read to you, and you should really open your Bible to this so you know where it's at, and, and you should... You should understand this, it has a lot of bearing on your life because whether or not this period of time the Bible is describing is actually going to happen is what is being debated in what we're discussing this period. So this, this debate, these four views, you could say are as essential as whether or not God meant what he was saying when he said that he created the earth in seven literal 24-hour days. And as we know from other studies we've done, there are views in the church that those were not literal seven 24-hour periods of time. They were ages describing how God, you know, they try to fit the millions of years of creation into that space. Well, if that is an affront to us as literal creationists, then taking the end of days less literally 
should be an affront to us too. Does that make sense? It will come as no surprise to you that people who do not take the millennium literally, by and large, I realize I'm generalizing, but those same people typically do not take Genesis literally. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why these issues matter. Let's read, starting in Revelation 20, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. I really love the great links that John goes to as describing this to make sure we don't misidentify who the devil is. The dragon... That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Like, don't be confused. I didn't paint him with broad strokes. I really filled in the details for you. He will be bound for a thousand years. That is an important phrase. Everybody, you realize during this millennium, Satan is bound. The next verse, verse 3, we're going to see why he is bound, what the purpose of that was. It says, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. How many would like to shut Satan up? And set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So here's what's key. During this thousand year period of time, we have just been told that Satan is bound, his mouth is shut, he's in a cave somewhere, a bottomless pit somewhere, personally experiencing what he had his brother, uh, Joseph's brothers do to him for himself to find out how horrible it was. And he cannot deceive the nations, the people, anymore. Before we go any further, how many of you believe there are deceived nations today? We're going to build out, okay, I want you to understand what matters here. But that's an essential point of doctrine. <clears throat> Revelation 20 verse 4 says, And I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, the beast being, of course, the Antichrist in this situation, and had not received his mark or their forehead, on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. People alive for a thousand year period of time. Do you know anyone on this planet right now who is a thousand years old other than Dennis? Revelation 20 verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. There is a period of people who died and if you study the rapture, what you're going to see is when Christ comes back for his church, the dead in Christ, Scripture tells us, rise first. That means everybody who is dead and not in Christ does what? Not rise. Not complicated stuff. The rest of the dead don't rise until after the thousand years has taken place. You with me? says this is the first resurrection. So we're dealing with not one, but two resurrections. Revelation 20, verse 6, our last verse that we're going to focus on this morning. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. We already saw that there's a group of people that are alive right, and reign with Christ. And there's a group of people who participated in the what? First resurrection. Distinct groups, things we need to begin to think about. Not going to get into all of this today, but as we talk about these things, I want you to develop a sense in your mind of treating revelation with precision. Precision. 
don't gloss over what's being said. Parse the information. Make outlines if you need to. It's a good practice to develop. No, I cannot always do it for you. The act of doing it yourself, putting pen to paper, embeds it in your skull. One of the reasons I know all this stuff is I built this presentation. It's in my mind because I actively engaged my brain to familiarize myself with it. So, so um, people often say to me, well, I don't understand how you, how you retain all of that stuff. Well, I've worked it through to the point that I can show it to somebody else. In your own study time, it is, it is a, a habit to behoove you to just take notes and, and, and learn how to organize information that you're seeing in different ways, groups of people, terms that are being used, what they mean. Yeah, you might not get it all right. That's okay. The very act of writing it down helps sink it into your brain. And sometimes trying to write it all down while I'm talking to you helps it not sink into your brain. And it's better just to listen to what I'm saying and then go back another time and look at the charts that I've given you. And study involves more than one time through. Does that make sense? I don't expect anybody to get this stuff the first time through. Okay, so here are the four groups, four views of the millennium. And again, these are the most commonly held views on Revelation 20. Yes, there may be other outliers. Yes, certain people may borrow. You know, some people approach theology as a smorgasbord. They are at Ponderosa or Golden Corral, and they're going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now, what are you going to get when you get, there's no consistent logic to any of it if you do that, but there are people out there that, that believe that way. When you understand the distinctions and the differences between them, you can tell when somebody's doing that and you can identify the logic that they're using and hopefully you can redress the situation by proper means, okay? The first group is called ah millennialism. Now, that's a funny term. Why ah? Well, because the guy was at the doctor, he was getting checked, and the doctor said, say ah, and then he named a theological viewpoint. No, that's not where we get this. And have you ever heard the term atheist? Well, what is a theist? A theist is someone who believes in God. What is ah in the Greek? It is someone who does not believe in God, or their belief is there is no God. Ah, theist means no God. So therefore, atheist. Have you heard the term agnostic? Gnostic means knowledge. Agnostic means, I don't know. It's someone who doesn't know if there's a God, right? So what does ah millennium mean? Somebody tell me. No millennium. It's that simple. They do not believe that what we just read in the Bible, described in very specific terms, is going to literally happen. They don't believe it. Okay? According to all millennialists, the Great Tribulation represents all disasters, wars, and persecutions that have occurred throughout church history. Most references to Israel in Revelation are symbolic references to the people of God on earth, not the nation of Israel as we know it, because according to them, the church has replaced Israel, Romans 9, 6 through 8, and Galatians 6, 16. In apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation, numbers represent concepts, not literal statistics. For example, 6 symbolizes incompleteness because 7 in the Bible is complete. Seven represents completeness. As I said, 10 indicates something that is extreme but limited. 12 represents the perfection of God's people. And a thousand, well, it, it just symbolizes a long time. That's all it's meant to symbolize. A long period of time. Whatever that may be, it's just a long time. God wasn't being precise. It doesn't actually mean a thousand years. Okay? That's amillennialism. We'll get into who believes in amillennialism in a minute. The next view is called post-millennialism, okay? Well, if something happens post something else, some, I'll start this way. We're going to get to the one, the next one says pre-millennialism, right? Pre, we all know what pre means. Pre means before. Post means after. 
So these guys believe that the return of Christ is going to happen after the millennium. Well, we just read that Christ is on the earth, according to Revelation chapter 20, during the millennium. So I don't know how he's reigning on the earth if he doesn't return till after the millennium. That confuses me. So, what they say is during the millennium, Christ will rule the earth through his spirit and through his church. He won't actually be here in the body, in the flesh. He will not, however, be physically present. The resurrection depicted in Revelation 20, verse 4, represents the spiritual re regeneration of people who trust in Christ. So that first revelation resurrection that we saw in there that seemed to literally be referring to people coming out of their graves well what it means is people are spiritually dead and when you come to Christ you're spiritually born again so in a sense you've already been spiritually resurrected that's the first resurrection you see how they begin to parse the terms differently than the common sense by show of hands who would have ever thought that by reading Revelation 20 1 through 6 that it was just spiritual no Okay. By show of hands, reading Revelation 20 through 6, who, who thought, just reading the text, that that meant, yeah, that's, that's a literal resurrection. People are coming out of the graves. Anybody believe that? Right? Okay. So that's, that's the point. It becomes a interpretation that isn't necessarily as straightforward as what the text actually means. And yet if you recall, as I showed you in the last session, futurists, well, futurists, they... Uh, they're supposedly forcing meaning into the text that isn't directly there. I think I'm demonstrating that it's actually some of these other views that, that do that. <clears throat> so, the second coming, the final conflict between good and evil, the defeat of Satan, the physical resurrection of all people, and the final judgment will all occur together at the same time immediately after this thousand-year period ends. That's post-millennialism. So now what we're going to do, I said four and a half views the other time. I think what I really meant to say is three and a half views. We're going to focus on premillennialism, but there's two branches of that. So that's what I'm going to put on the screen first. And this first version of premillennialism, people who believe that Christ will return before this thousand-year period of time, like Revelation 20 clearly indicates there, okay? There's a group that are called historicists, or here's a, here's a fun little word for you. It's called chiliasm. And it doesn't mean they wish we'd turn the AC off. It's, it's a term that, that um, from a different language, still means thousand, okay? So it's, it's like another term for millennialism. They believe that Christ will come back before. So, there is some confusion about the covenants, the old and the new covenant, when it comes to these groups. Historical premillennialists believe God's promises of the land and blessings to Abraham were conditional promises based on obedience. And of course, in this church, we reveal through the word of God that God's promises to Abraham were non-conditional. Because Abraham fell asleep, and God walked through the two pieces of that covenant by himself. In other words, God made covenant for Abraham with himself. So there was no part of the covenant that Abraham had to keep. God made promises to Abraham that were unconditional. Now, the promises that God gave to Israel under the law of Moses, we know the end of Deuteronomy, right? They stand on this mountain, and they stand on the other mountain, and here's the blessings if you keep my covenant, and here's the curses if you don't keep my covenant. <coughs> The covenant of the law was a conditional covenant. So the historical premillennialists, they've got some covenantal confusion there. The Chileists, they believe that Abraham's promises were unconditional. Okay, But both Israel's persistent disobedience violated God's covenant with them. And then co the covenant of grace maintained in the Old and New Testament is only for true believers. Okay, what they mean by that is all who trusted in Christ, these believers embodied today in the church are the true Israel. So again, we have this notion that somehow the church replaces the nation of Israel 
Israel defaulted on its promises, and now only God's true people, the true Israel, or the church. Now, all of the, the mentions of Israel in Revelation are really code for the church. Does that make sense? But as I've described to you, when we get to Revelation chapter 4, the distinctions of the church pretty much disappear. It's there in some symbolic ways. But when Revelation says Israel, it means Israel, because Israel and the church are distinct. Different origins, different destinies, different purposes. Okay? And I've showed you that image of a chess clock. When one starts, the other one stops. They don't believe that. Then what we have is dispensational premillennialists. Now, I know that that's a lot of terms. The good news is this is the only one that you really need to remember if you're in agreement with what this church teaches because this is what we are. That doesn't mean we agree with everything taught in standardized dispensational premillennialism, but this is what we are. And what does that mean? Well, according to dispensational premillennialists, during the great tribulations, many Jews will turn to Christ. Why? Because the book of uh, the Old Testament prophets says that, that in their persecution they will look upon him who they pierced and they will cry out. And it is when Israel cries out in repentance for crucifying Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ returns. That is the precondition for the second coming. Israel must repent for crucifying the Messiah. God's promises to Abraham under this view and his offspring were completely unconditional. Therefore, the Jews will still receive the land described in Genesis 15 through 18 as promised. God is not done with his covenant people. So therefore, we believe that the church and Israel are distinct. That is one of the fundamental tenets of dispensationalism. Therefore, where do we get that term? Well, we get it because... There are dispensations or different periods or ages that God interacts with people differently. Prior to the coming of the law, say Adam till Moses was one dispensation. From the law to the coming of Christ and his accomplishment was another dispensation. Then the church age. In fact, traditional uh, dispensationalism lays out seven ages. I don't know if I agree with every one of them, but just so you know, that's there. So all references in Revelation to Israel refer to the nation of Israel. It's not complicated. What the text says, the text means. And then one of the other things we'll see distinctly in upcoming and subsequent sessions is that the rapture is considered a separate event from the second coming of Christ. And yet both of these views, historical or chiliastic and dispensational premillennialism, believe that Christ returns before the millennial. So let's go just a little bit deeper. The amillennial view of Revelation 20 treats it as symbolic or allegorical. So what does this view really teach? Okay? So, in amillennialism, the millennium is the spiritual reign of Jesus in the hearts of his followers. The first resurrection in Revelation 20, verse 5, is not a physical restoration from the dead. It is a spiritual resurrection that is also known as regeneration, salvation, transformation, sanctification, more Christ's triumph over Satan through his death and resurrection in 32 AT, restrained the power of Satan on earth. How many of you all feel like Satan's power has been restrained on the earth? Can you imagine how bad it would be if it wasn't? This is him restrained. You understand why we got problems with this view? Have you watched the news recently? Persecution of Christians, tribulation will occur until Jesus comes, as will the expansion of God's kingdom. It isn't a specific period of tribulation described in the Bible as seven years, 1260 days, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's just allegorical. 
So the thousand millen the thousand year millennial reign isn't to be taken literally, it just means a long time. Resurrection, judgment, eternity all commence immediately at the second coming. There are scriptures that would seem to support this view. The Bible does use the number a thousand figuratively in a few places. Doesn't mean it uses it figuratively in all places. The first rev resurrection, Revelation 20, verse 4, could refer to spiritual rebirth or new birth, but that doesn't seem to be the plain meaning of the text. Uh, and then the second coming of Christ and resurrection of the saved and unsaved occur at the same time. Daniel 12, 2 and 3, John 5 through 28 and 29. Yes, you can read those scriptures to the exclusion of others and maybe get that view. But again, our counsel here is always to take the whole counsel of the word of God and not just a few. And clarity always comes when we take the whole counsel of the word of God. Now, saints on earth during the tribulation. Yes, there's obviously some saints on earth during the tribulation. Revelation 13, 7 tells us who are they? Where did they come from? It's not all of us. Again, it's a limited view. So where did this view come from? Well, perhaps, uh, no surprise, one of the biggest supporters of it is John Calvin. Men like Martin Luther. Burkhauer, others. <clears throat> but perhaps, one of the most shocking things is this is the eschatological viewpoint of the Roman Catholic Church. So while the Protestant Reformation did a lot to move us back to what the Bible had to say on a lot of topics, it failed to address the eschatological problems that the Roman Catholic Church has. It just carried them forward. So when people accuse, I don't know, our view of being new, perhaps it's not new at all. Perhaps it just took longer to get restored to the church after coming out of the Dark Ages than did other things like soteriology and salvation and, and doctrines like that. Does that make sense? So the way it would look is Satan's power is restrained sometime around the cross and Jesus' uh, accomplishment. The millennium and the tribulation are all happening around us every day right now during the church age. The second coming is going to come at some undetermined point that we really don't have any signs that point to with any specificity. It could happen any moment because God is capricious and unknowable and verses that he says that he does nothing without revealing it to his prophets are pretty much unreliable. Sent the tone. It's not a good eschatological view. Postmillennialism views the millennium as our current period and Jesus returning after it. There's some similarities here. But it's important to understand some of the distinctions and what does this view teach? Well, postmillennialism describes the millennial reign in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 6, as a long time period when through the preaching of the gospel, most of the world, hear this phrase, most of the world will submit to Jesus Christ. Most of the world will submit to Jesus Christ. This is why most preterists are post-millennialists. Because prophecy has already been fulfilled. Now it's the job of the church to preach the gospel and advance the kingdom. During this time, Satan will have no power over the earth. Not, not just restrained, like the amillennial view said. He has no power over the earth. And evil regimes will collapse, according to Revelation 19, 19 through 20, verse 3. Most of the world comes to Christ. So along with preterism, this is the root of something called dominion theology, which falls into very fundamentalist, cessationistic camps, and then magically it transforms and it shows up in Pentecostal charismatic camps, and that's where we get IHOP, that's where we get um, uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, that's where we get uh, 
all of these different groups that have this belief that it is the church's job to present itself a spotless bride because Christ can't come back until the church is a spotless bride. So through the contemporary charismatic movement, God has been binding Satan. When the church recognizes the fullness of its power through the Holy Spirit, the church will establish God's kingdom on the earth and usher in the millennium, which will be a golden age, and that's when Jesus will come back. I don't know about you, but when I read those six verses in Revelation chapter 20, it seemed like everything started to straighten out after Jesus showed up on the scene. And in this church, we have a fundamental principle called the law of one degree. And that just means you only have to be off by one degree in a journey of a thousand miles to miss your destination completely, right? At what point did we forget the phrase where Jesus is the one who gives the white raiment to the church? She doesn't make herself righteous. She doesn't clean herself up to present herself pure to the king. The king says, oh, honey, you're a mess. Let me clean you up. We're going to make you look beautiful. And while many people who believe in these doctrines will acknowledge that Christ is our righteousness and will rightly teach that when it comes to eschatological things, when it comes to the authority of the believer, when it comes to spiritual mapping and praying down strongholds and deliverance ministries and all of this other stuff, it's all because Satan has no authority on the earth right now whatsoever. And we agree, we believe that Satan has no authority if we stand in our authority as Jesus Christ, but he's not bound. I don't even know if Satan's bound, shut up, sealed in a cave somewhere. Somebody made his leash too long. Demonic activity still happens in our world today. He's not completely shut off. When, when God says zero, cannot deceive, don't you think he means zero? Or just zero with a few holes in the bottom? So some deception can slip through. Let me put it to you another way. Do you understand why it is important that there be a thousand-year period of time when Jesus is physically on the planet, ruling with what is described as a rod of iron? That means, like, you don't want to be under his rule, you get curb stomped because he just does not tolerate disobedience during this period of time. And if Satan is bound, shut up, cannot deceive the nations, then whose fault is it for disobedience? I can see the gears grinding. What it means is nobody can stand before God after a thousand years and say, well, the devil made me do it. See, right now, from Eden onward, there's an excuse. Well, we have a roaming lion seeking who may devour us. He deceives us. He's the father of lies. Jesus, you said we're of our father, the devil. And what he's saying is, no, sin is intrinsic to the fallen human condition. And only redemption in me. Why do you think, why do you think God goes to the trouble of locking him away only to let him out again for a period of time. Because even after a thousand years, what is an atheist going to do after having a thousand years of seeing Christ rule from David's throne in Jerusalem on high-definition television broadcast around the world for a thousand years? He's going to say, yeah, I don't believe in God. But, 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 yeah, you, that, that, that's like special effects. They can do so much with special effects today. He's not really there. And Revelation goes on to describe that after that thousand years, people will still gather together, go to war with Jesus, 
and Satan is released to lead them. But whose desire is it to go to war with Jesus in the first place? They can't say the devil made me do it. So once that kind of rebellion takes place, is God unjust in sending any of those people into eternal hellfire? They had a thousand years with no excuses. And the promise is there are those who will be able to serve him through that. So the next time an atheist tells you, well, how is God just in sending some people? What about that little boy in Africa who, who never heard the gospel? Yeah, what about him? You understand how it puts those arguments to shame? You're done. It'll be a thousand years of little boys in Africa who get to hear about Jesus. He's, let me tell you, he's got a PA system planned where he can announce what his rule is when he's on the planet Earth, right? Those arguments don't work. He, God will eliminate. That's why when Romans says you are without excuse, at that point we will have the ultimate realization of the promise that mankind is without excuse. We didn't get it the first time. He was just, a, he was just an itinerant rabbi. His brothers didn't even follow him at first. He smelt bad. He had B.O. How are we supposed to follow this guy? No, no, no. He came back. He split a mountain. He ruled for a thousand years, and you still wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. You are the definition of stupid. Well, the devil made me do it. No, no. He's locked up. I made a show of locking him up. It's not the NASA moon landing, but there will be people, well, that was a conspiracy. In the face of the most blatant truth you can possibly imagine, people will still reject, and that's why this view doesn't work. But there are scriptures that they claim support this view. Every ethnic group will receive the gospel before the second coming. This is typical of people who believe in postmillennialism. They also typically don't believe that all have a free will call to salvation, that all are elect. God predetermined some to go to heaven and some go to hell. And it doesn't really mean that the gospel will be preached to all. It'll just be preached to all people groups. And so they bring that specific argument into this. The first resurrection could refer to spiritual resurrection, same kind of thing. The second coming of Christ and the resurrection of all people, same thing, will happen at the same time. Postmillennialists place great emphasis on preaching the gospel. They, con uh, they contend that the gospel will eventually spread in such a way that nearly everyone in the world will turn to Christ. One scripture cited in favor of this view is Mark 3.27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then will plunder his house. And Augustine understood this verse to mean that before Jesus can claim his kingdom, those that are lost, i.e. the possessions of Satan, the strong man, must come under the control of Jesus. Postmillennialists tend to emphasize the power of the gospel to transform societies and individual lives, and that's where we get the seven mountain mandate of Lance Wall now and others. The earliest writer, who is clearly postmillennialist, lived in the 1100s to 1200s, although many historians believe that earlier church leaders like Eusebius, Athanasius, Augustine were probably post-millennialists, even though Augustine really founded amillennialism. <clears throat> and during the 1800s, the same 50-year period that saw the rise of preterism, post-millennialism increased in popularity. Some Christians even believe that the increased work of missionaries throughout the world represented the beginning of the millennium. The golden age is described, they say, in places like Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Jeremiah 31, Daniel 2, and Micah 4. But see, when post-millennialism really started to fall out of favor was after we flipped past the 1800s and the 1900s rolled around. And what happened? Two world wars. And so people who had been deceived into thinking that maybe Satan was really bound, they had a hard time digesting that a, that a world in which Satan was bound could have the genocide of millions of Jews. So post-millennialism started to fall out of favor, but it was hyped by people like Jonathan Edwards in the 1800s, Charles Hodge, 
Lorraine Botner, a famous Calvinist, and R.C. Sproul, recently deceased, but uh, a great Calvinist preacher. So post-millennialism looks like this. Jesus returns after the millennialism. The church age takes place. There's a tribulation. There's the millennium. Then Jesus returns. Um, and the tribulation is viewed as a brief time of persecution that occurs immediately before the millennium. Others usually, the preterists, believe that the great tribulation describes the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. We'll move through these next two fairly quickly. Historical premillennialism views the millennium as a future event, though not as we do. This view teaches that Christians go through the great tribulation. The tribulation will purify the churches by rooting out false believers, and the second coming of Christ will precede the millennium. Millennialism. Never mind. Historical premillennialism believes that the church was replaced the nation of Israel as God's covenant people, also known as covenant premillennialism. It treats the thousand year millennium as a literal future event. And the earliest church fathers envisioned an earthly millennium. During, I can't do it, it's gone. During these first centuries of Christian faith, the church's theologians anticipated not only a physical reign of Jesus following a time of testing, but also the restoration of all creation to its original goodness in a millennial kingdom. Historical millennialism began to fade as later church fathers, influenced by Greek philosophy that viewed the physical world as evil and by the uh, aftermath of some Christians, false expectations, they downplayed it as, as a real millennium. As, as, as people began to look at physicality as, as carnal, they began to spiritualize things. This happened with Oregon and others. But there are scriptures in support of this view. They believe the revealing of the Antichrist precedes the return of Christ. We do too. The problem is we believe there's a rapture prior to the revealing of the Antichrist, and there's reason for that. The tribulation will root out false members from churches. Well, you know what? We believe that too, but the problem is there will be people who have to believe in Christ after the church is gone. The saints on the earth during the tribulation, again, we believe there are saints on the earth during the tribulation. They're just a different class of saints of ours. It doesn't mean they're not going to have to live for Jesus. It just means we are not promised wrath from God. God's promises to Abraham and his offspring were conditional. We already covered that. And again, they believe the New Testament frequently uses Israel and 12 tribes to refer to Christians. And that is grossly taking those scriptures out of context. But it did have some ancient supporters, so it still holds some weight. Men like Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, probably Papias, and Georgie Ladd. And of course, it looks like this, the church age and then the great tribulation, different than post-millennialism. They do believe that society grows increasingly evil, whereas post-millennialism believes that society is going to get better and better and better and better because everybody's getting saved. And Jesus is going to come back for one big happy party. The second coming of Christ and then a millennial reign with him on the earth, but not that that millennial reign serves the same purpose. And then, of course, we have dispensational premillennialism. This is us. It views the millennium as a future event, but it teaches a literal hermeneutic, a literal theory of interpretation of the book of Revelation. It's the belief that Jesus will come back to earth after a literal seven-year tribulation and will rule during a literal thousand-year millennium of peace on earth. God will still give the nation of Israel the land described in Genesis from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, the full extent of King Solomon's kingdom, because God's covenant with Abraham is unconditional. Most dispensational millennialists, and this is something we'll talk about in a subsequent lesson coming up very soon, are what is called pre-tribulationists, because as if none of this was enough, even when you get into our camp, 
People come down the pipe and they decide, well, we've settled all of that. Let's find something else we can argue about. And they start to argue about whether Christ is going to come back before the tribulation, after the tribulation, or sometime in the middle of the tribulation. We'll answer all those questions coming up. Not super important right now. But the rapture is understood as the event where Christ removes Christians from the earth before the great tribulation begins to most dispensationalists. Although some believe that it'll happen midway because technically in that seven-year period, the wrath is only the last three and a half years. There is some truth to that. Scriptures used to support this view show that God will remove Christians before the outpouring of his wrath during the tribulation. Revelation 1 1 Thessalonians 5.9 clearly says that we are not appointed to wrath. Therefore, because the tribulation is not just like the amillennialists believe, just tribulations in general and bad things happening. No, the great tribulation is described in the Bible as God pouring out his wrath on the wicked of the earth. It is not tribulation caused by Satan. It is tribulation inflicted by God. And if we are filled by the Holy Spirit, made the righteousness in Christ, then 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says we have not been appointed to wrath. Why would God pour his wrath out on us? Ergo, we must be removed. Revelation 3.10 promises the church in Philadelphia that we will be saved from the hour of the trial, a very specific period of time. If you read it in your Bible, the second the is not there. It's translated out. But it is in the Greek. Of course, we believe that God's promises to Abraham and his offspring were unconditional from Genesis 15, as I described earlier. The lampstands are on the earth in Revelation 1 through 3. And of course, from our study of Revelation, you can see that the lampstands are the church. Jesus is the high priest. And he tells Ephesus, I will trim your lampstand and remove you if you don't clean up your act. The lampstands are the church. Where are the lampstands? When we get to the scene in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, oh, they're not on the earth, they're in heaven. The rapture just happened. The church has been translated to another location. And then, of course, the church is not specifically or explicitly mentioned between Revelation 4 and Revelation 19. Now, despite many attempts to prove otherwise, this view has roots as early as the second century. Many opponents say it did not emerge until 1830 among a group of Plymouth brethren and that it began with this guy, a man by the name of J. Nelson Darby, who they even go a step further, and we'll debunk this next time. I'm not going to get into it today. I'm just telling you. They debunk it further by saying that he got his information by a lady by name uh, of Margaret MacDonald who was conducting seances and she got this bright idea in the 1830s. And so this, this, our whole view, it just comes straight from the pit of hell. It's just demonic. What they will say. Better understand that it's not. Men like C.I. Schofield, Harry A. Ironside, Gleason Archer, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, Even the great Calvinist John MacArthur, man, he gets something right, praise the Lord. Charles Stanley, Tim LaHaye, and the revered Dr. Chuck Missler, they teach this view. So, God's work with Israel takes place up until the cross, at which point a mystery not revealed in the Old Testament, the church is born at Pentecost, There is a pre-tribulation rapture at which point Israel's clock begins again. The great tribulation has to do with pouring out judgment on the world for its treatment of Israel. That's why it all has to do with Israel. Some say it may be a middle uh, tribulation rapture. Then, of course, the second coming takes place when Israel repents after all that wrath is poured out. Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives. We see the picture that we saw in Revelation 20 at the beginning of this session, and he rules on earth literally 
for a thousand years while Satan is bound before the final judgment. So real quickly, where you begin determines where you end up. Idealist, post-millennial, futurist, preterist. As you come down that line, you'll see if you're a futurist, you are likely pre-millennial. If you're post-millennial, you are likely to be preterist. Or if you're preterist and post-millennial, you're likely to be post-millennial. If you're idealist and, or, or um, uh, uh, spiritualist, you likely are amillennial and spiritualize everything. But your hermeneutic, your theory of interpretation, where you're at on that scale on the bottom of the chart, your willingness to allegorize or symbolize scripture depends on where you will fall on this chart. And because we take a precise view of scripture, a literal, a grammatical, a historical view of scripture, that's where we fall. And as I said, next time we'll talk about the whole pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib view that, that breaks into our camp. The thing I want you to walk away with, though, is it's about more than just last things. Our view of last things can actually derive our first priorities. The best indicator of any view is perhaps the fruit that comes from the root. What are the doctrines that come out of what they believe? I realize this is a lot of information to take in. And now it's available for you to go back to whenever you want to refresh yourself. Because there is more to the church world than what we just see in our churches. And I know growing up as a kid, going to the same church, I wasn't exposed to all this stuff. And, and the bottom line is I want you to understand that there's more out there. Because chances are you have friends, you have loved ones, they've got different views from you. And, and I want to say this clearly. I said this at the beginning. There are good people who love Jesus who have these different views. This is not about whether or not those people are going to heaven. But it can determine a lot about how we think about what we're supposed to do while we're down on the ground and still around. Does that make sense? Here at this church, we believe you have to understand why we believe what we believe. And if I don't do this kind of stuff, then I leave you in the dark and I will never do that. So with that said, let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. For clarity, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that as we continue to develop the sessions that come, that the reason we take the stance that we take will become clearer and clearer to everyone within the sound of my voice, and that it will help people in their own study and their own research to come to their own conclusions. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would teach with clarity, and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, the offering is in the back or click the button on our Facebook page to go to our giving portal. We need you to be cheerful givers. We love you. There's so much good information to come. We'll deal with the rapture next week. God bless and go with God.